Welcome back uh, to Yahoo Finance Live. A worrying new COVID variant that was detected by researchers at Texas A&M University. It showed a concerning uh, resemblance to some other variants that we've seen in terms of antibody resistance and potentially more severe illness. Uh, experts there say that the strain dubbed BB1 for the Brazos Valley region where it stems from uh, shares genetic characteristics with the B117 variant that was first uh, discovered in the UK, which for a while now has made up the majority of new infections back here in the U.S. And for more on that and all of the other uh, top coronavirus headlines we're watching here, we're joined by Dr. Jeremy Faust, emergency medicine physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Dr. Faust, good to be chatting with you again. Uh, it seems like we, I mean, we talk about variants a lot here, so I know that there's a lot of, of them for viewers at home to keep track of. But when it comes to what we're hearing about this one, particularly down in Texas, uh, how worried are you about maybe some of the things we're learning now? Good to see you. I remain kind of similar on the variant question, which is that so far the variants have represented incremental setbacks, a little bit of breakthrough on mild infections. The B117 variant might have a slight uptick in mortality, certainly more contagious, but not really changing the whole shape of the pandemic, not like a total cataclysmic change. But the thing that worries me is that there are still so many infections that we give the virus an opportunity to mutate. And once in a while, one of those mutations does crop up in a way that can hurt us. And so what I keep hoping that I won't wake up and read in the next paper is that now I've got one that's 10 times worse or one that hits kids a lot harder. So I keep every time I hear a new variant, I think, OK, another incremental setback is potentially upon us. But so far, I haven't seen one that has really just blown the whole thing up and you know turned this into you know the kinds of fatality rates you'd see with a pathogen like Ebola, for example. To what extent is that risk of new variants coming online elevated uh, when you've got uh, still about half the population that isn't vaccinated? It, it feels like things really accelerated for the first half, but now you're hearing about supply outpacing demand. Well, this is the argument why we need to vaccinate people who are young. There's a prevailing feeling that if you're not an old person, that you don't have to worry about this virus. And then if you got infected, you would just gain natural immunity and move on with your lives. The problem there is just what you're getting at, which is the more people who are not vaccinated, the more infections we have. And infections are where mutations occur. Infections are where variants emerge from. That's the opportunity. So when I wrote with Angie Rasmussen in the New York Times last month or this month, we wrote, look, we really feel like we got to vaccinate the kids as soon as we know that the safety data is there, primarily because we don't want to wait around for a variant. So yeah, the, the way to, to keep variants from cropping up is to minimize infections. And we do see that the vaccines not only protect against disease, but seem to have a major impact, not complete protection, but a major impact on lowering infections as well. That's interesting you, you bring up the infection rate among children, because in, in Michigan right now, where we know that the spike's uh, pretty bad relative to where we're watching elsewhere in the US, rates of child infections, they're now higher than they've been uh, at any point in the pandemic. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily how much that might stem from the fact you know, that, that something else is going on or just the fact that you know, kids aren't getting vaccinated right now. But when you shift and look at maybe other uh, policies getting put into place right now, we're looking at California's Cal State and UC program also requiring COVID vaccinations for students to return back there in the fall semester. And we get into questions about vaccinating and rules like that. Uh, what's your take on kind of where you draw the line when it comes to schools putting in policies like that? Well, I think every jurisdiction is going to have its own legal challenges. There's going to be, that's a lot of that's for the, the law side of things. But what I would say is that it's not unusual for us, for organizations to require vaccinations. You can't send your kid to school without proof of vaccination and for all the vaccines that we get routinely. Now, I grant you this is a, an emergency use authorization uh, scheme that we have. It's not an FDA approved. So some people would argue that until these vaccines have full approval, you can't put them in the same bucket. Others have said that that, that does not apply and that they're good enough and that the, the public safety uh, interests there make it so that a vaccine mandate in various jurisdictions is, is not only wise, but um, legally permissible. But I'll leave that to the legal experts. What I will say is that the, the, the rising number of infections in young people does catch my eye. 
And I think I've said this before, you know, it's, you take a, a large number of people, millions and millions of kids, and a very small percentage of them would have serious infections, but that's still a lot of people. And it, it doesn't escape my notice that yes, kids have been spared comparatively, thank goodness, but more kids died of COVID last year um, than usually die of all respiratory diseases combined. So that's something that I think people don't realize. That you, the very few number of American children die um, of respiratory illnesses. It's usually under 500. Um, mm -hmm. So flu, for example, would be uh, 150 a year. So COVID's actually harder on kids than we realize, and it's worth protecting them against. And doctor, finally, we had heard going into the summer um, what herd immunity could potentially look like, about 80% of people getting vaccinated. What do you think should be the metric now um, as, we, as we look to the summer months? Is it the case counts on a daily basis? You know, is it another number? And, and do you think there should be sort of the, a universal standard? Yeah, this is really challenging. And this is a great example of how, how do you combine everything we know about epidemiology, virology, and public health to make a policy. And it's difficult. But what I would say is, as vaccination becomes more widespread, I think case counts become less important. Because there was this sort of COVID denying a, a year ago, or even the past few months, where people say, oh, it's just you know cases. It's not really illness. They, they were wrong. But as we move through the population and vaccinate more people, there's a point there that at some point, if I if I get a case of mild COVID, but I don't really notice it, then my case doesn't really matter as long as I'm not spreading it to others who could be harmed. So for me, a really good metric to watch is hospitalizations. Hospitalizations gives you a pretty good sense of how people are doing in the community. And I'm looking for her. I don't, heart immunity is going to be a moving target because natural immunity could wane. We don't know how long the vaccine immunity will last, although I'm pretty optimistic it'll last a while. So to me, the way you know you're at a place where you can kind of return to normal is if our rates of flu-like illnesses and COVID-like illnesses, which we track, if those rates are kind of close to our historical norms, not the norms of the last 15 months or whatever it's been, then I think that's where you know you're really through it. And I want to see a sustained low level of hospitalizations. That's what I'm looking for. Some good context there. Dr. Jeremy Faust, emergency medicine physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, always good to talk to you.